joining us. The uh, great uh, former prosecutor, now uh, defense attorney, David Katz, joins us to help sort out. This is a special edition of uh, Katz Adamus and the David Katz uh, sorting out of a, yet another uh, legal judgment in the world of Donald Trump. Uh, first of all, David, thank you for joining us. Great to be with you to talk about this bombshell, $83 million against Trump. Can a jury come up with whatever figure they want? Where did that figure come from? At some point, the courts are going to say that it's disproportionate, and that will be one of his issues on appeal. At $65 million in punitive damages, the jury found it as punitive damages. You don't need to go through and figure out, oh, I wonder what part of it was for this or that. There's about $10 million for reputational repair. In other words, something that a person like her would actually do to try to get her reputation back. Uh, you could spend some money on it. I guess you could you know, uh, publicize the fact that you know, if you were a more normal person, now because of the huge media coverage that it's gotten, I think it has repaired her reputation to a large extent um, because people, I think, have a different view of her, having won now twice. Um, but, you know, she says, I've been hurt terribly. Not only did these people threaten to kill me, and she's gotten something for her pain and suffering. That's about seven or eight million. So seven or eight million for her pain and suffering, 10 million for a remedy she might take that would cost her $10 million to help repair her reputation, but $65 million for punitive damages. And you can say that that's fairly proportionate. And on top of that, Mark, uh, one of the great uh, legal, I mean, it's going to be one of these things people study in law school for decades, is that the um, uh, Kaplan and her side, and she's not related to Judge Kaplan, so that's confusing, but Roberta Kaplan and her law firm, who are representing E. Jean Carroll, got a hold of this deposition that he gave. And, you know, Trump has always played this game that when it suits his purposes, he's very rich and he's also very poor, talking about the same assets. So during the deposition, Trump thought that it helped him to show himself as very rich. So he said, I have $400 million in cash under oath. He said, I have a $10 billion company under oath. And so that was played to this jury and to get somebody's attention and to deter them and to get them to stop defaming E. Jean Carroll, they could argue to the jury, well, a guy with $400 million cash and a $10 billion company to give this guy the message, you need $65 million in punitive damage. So on balance, I think it's going to stand up in the appeals court against the argument that it's disproportionate for this defendant who is recalcitrant about it. He's been incorrigible on this issue. And let me say one last thing. When he gave his press conference afterwards or his truth social postings afterwards where he blasted the judge and he blasted the legal system, he was very careful not to defame E. Jean Carroll again. He's finally gotten the memo. But uh, I, I go back to my, uh, I mean, you, you explain and contextualize quite well how they got that number in an acceptable framework of what might be held up on appeal, for example, given, as you suggested, what was in deposition from Trump under oath. But when you're a juror, is there some guideline? Like, I wouldn't know as a juror just sitting there, 13 million, 30 million, where, where does 83 million come from? Well, they made an argument as to all three items of damages. They made a showing uh, of what it would cost to repair her reputation. I see. Okay. They, made a, okay. they made a showing as to the pain and suffering. They showed that there'd been this torrent of, um, you know, uh, social hate. media posts yeah. against her, threatening her life, uh, saying all kinds of awful things. What pain and suffering would that cause? And you argue that back and forth. You know, I the see. other side, Trump's side, argued that, well, you know, this was giving her the celebrity that she was losing. Otherwise, Elle magazine was in the dumps. Her, you know, her column was. They should wasn't, be thanking me. Right. They right, should right. be thanking me. Yes, Trump is always the victim. Uh, they should be thanking me. They should be awarding me money. Remember that the deposition that he gave was not in this case. So it was very clever to get a hold of it, uh, to show the judge why it was relevant in this case, and to play it in this case. I think his ruling is safe on that. When you have someone saying under oath, uh, fairly recently, that he was worth four hundred, a uh, ten billion dollar company, four hundred million dollars in cash. I think that's very relevant because your ability to pay, you know, you and I would be deterred by a whole lot less than sixty five million dollars. I haven't seen your balance sheet, but uh, you know, but Trump is bragging, and so the the great line is, if you're a self 
self-proclaimed billionaire, uh, what, what did they say? G grab him by the wallet. Grab him by the wallet. Remember, he said, grab him by the you know what? So if you're a self boasting billionaire, grab him by the wallet, Trump. They just grabbed you by the wallet. So let's speak now to recovering those funds. You explained in your visit last week uh, as to the bond that Trump posted. I thought that was really a good explanation. Maybe you want to review it for the audience that may not have seen it. But so that there is already some money in the system for E. Jean Carroll. This is a huge judgment, uh, as noted. Um, will she get this? How does she get this? Uh, is it posted in some escrow un until she gets it? How does it proceed from here? Well, I believe that she'll get it someday or a lot of it someday, but it won't be today. Um, and the reason it won't be today uh, let me go back to the first trial that they had. That was the one with Joe Tacopina. He was an interesting character who represented Trump. He didn't represent Trump this time. He only got off this case in early January, uh, leaving it in the hands of Alina Haba. And there's been a lot of discussion back and forth about she, how she handled it as a lawyer. Um, and I don't really want to get into that, although we can if you want to. But the five million. Well, just dollars, because you mentioned it, the discussion essentially is that she was really in over her head and that she she uh, really just didn't know what she was doing. And there was chapter and verse posted online about it. So uh, you can return to it in, in a little bit if you want. Well, talk about it right now. Let me talk about it right now, then, so we don't yeah. jump around. Um, you know, uh, it's, somebody has to have their first really big case at some point in their career. You know, the first time that I faced off with Johnny Cochran, I told my boss. I said, I'm up against Johnny Cochran. <laughs> Can I get some reinforcements in here? And my boss said, no, if you lose it, you lose it on your own. I ended up winning it. Of course, that's usually why lawyers are telling the story, because it was a victory. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so I, I beat Johnny Cochran. That was about three years before uh, the glove don't fit, you must acquit. And, uh, you know, his uh, just as an attorney, his uh, remarkable uh, and really marvelous as an attorney, victory for O.J. Simpson. You know, a lot of people thought it was pretty unlikely based on the evidence. And I think Johnny Cochran, it has to be remembered, may he rest in peace, did a great job in that case. But uh, my point is that, you know, at some point I had to try, you know, my first really big case and I did and I won. And I, I think Trump was, his judgment was so terrible in this case that he didn't get a more experienced team, that he didn't keep Taco Pina he should have known a federal judge was not going to give him a delay. He should have known if he walked in there and said, oh, my lawyer from the first trial, Taco Pina, who knows it so well, we had a, a, you know, a dispute, blah, 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 that, that the judge is not going to be sympathetic to it. So I don't think that's going to be error that he had to proceed to trial with this relatively inexperienced attorney. But there were some things along the way that it seems kind of surprising that they missed. You know, one of the things, and this Roberta Kaplan has this wonderful associate. Uh, on the case. She's a former law clerk to Judge Kaplan. She's Judge Kaplan's law clerk. That was disclosed on the record that she was the law clerk. And then they raised that during the trial at some point. Well, you can't raise that during the trial. You can bring a motion. You, the motion can be several ways, Mark. You can say that, look, she's been this judge's law clerk. Well, that's not necessarily a violation of ethics. It's not like this lawyer was the judge's wife or the judge's son. But, you know, law clerk, there's a very special relationship between uh, a law clerk and the judge. And I think it's really a bad precedent. I think it's a bad idea uh, for law clerks to go in front of the federal judge that they clerk for. I never took a case in front of the federal judge that I clerk for. And I know a lot of lawyers who feel the same way. And, you know, to tell a potential client, let's say, well, you know, uh, I think I do a great job. I think I'd be a really zealous advocate for you. Here's my background. And then your competing lawyer says, I was the law clerk to the judge. He sang at my wedding. He married me. Uh, that, that, that just hits me as um, that first lawyer ought to get the case. I ought to get that case in that situation, not some lawyer who touts the fact that you know the judge sang at his wedding. Now, Judge Kaplan did not sing at her wedding so far as I know I wasn't there, but he did marry her and her husband on top of being the law clerk. Um, her spouse. I don't know that it was a husband, you know, but uh, whoever the former law clerk married and is now the one of the stars of winning this case was the judge's law clerk. So, you know, there's two ways. You can move to recuse the judge on that basis. And if you lose, you can t take it up on appeal. And you think that's something that Trump, with all of his, you know, minions and all of his money would have done. Apparently he didn't. And you can also move to have that particular lawyer not work on the case. And you can try to knock out 
that lawyer's whole law firm, which, believe me, would have been a great move for Trump tactically if he could have gotten this Roberta Kaplan because she was zealous, she was assiduous. You know, she's been on this thing. She's been on it when the chips were down. She's obviously the lawyer who persuaded that angel to give them $10 million at the beginning of the case in case they collected nothing for themselves and E. Jean Carroll. They had that $10 million. She assembled a tremendous team. So why Trump didn't move, Mark, to get her knocked off the case or to get the judge? He knew uh, Kaplan was a bad pick for him. Now, people will say, well, he would have gotten another federal judge in the Southern District of New York. And but it, it just the whole way that it was working out, Kaplan just seemed, especially after the first trial, that they should have made, they should have done every effort in motions and in an appeal, in a writ of mandate to try to get Judge Kaplan off of their case. I'm not saying he did anything wrong. I'm just saying tactically, from their point of view, given Kaplan's rulings in the first trial, because in the first trial, there were a lot of controversial rulings by Kaplan. Remember this, Mark, if they win that first trial appeal, they'll win this appeal. Right. And the reason they'll win this appeal is this appeal is all based on the fact that a jury has conclusively determined that Trump assaulted her. And of course, then he's lying when he says, I didn't assault her. It was all a hoax. This woman's making it up. Even after the verdict where the five million dollars came in, he went out and said, it's a hoax. She's making it up. So that's the aggravating conduct. But if the first jury uh, award is not good and that could be because Judge Kaplan made mistakes. So there would be a new trial ordered there. And then depending how that new trial came out, this second trial would come out differently. But in terms of paying the $83 million, here's what Trump has to do. He has to either put up $83 million. Now, you know, I don't believe a lot of what he says. Uh, I don't believe most of what he says, but he says he has $400 million cash. He's got the Trump Tower. You know, a lot of people are joking it's going to be called the E. Jean Carroll Tower pretty soon. Um, <laughs> he's going to be very, he'll sell other things before he sells Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue to, you know, for the award. So uh, he could find a bank to lend him the money. If someone will lend him $83 million, he can put up like you can get money for anything. He can but, put but, up. But wait a minute. To this point, he will have to put it up. On what kind of timeline will he have to put it up? Uh, very soon. Uh, very soon. Probably in the next couple of weeks. This is an urgent matter for him right now because he's got to do uh, one of three things. He's got to put up $83 million cash. I think he'll be very reluctant to have a cash outflow. And he can't, get, he can't do the big scam. He can't do the big lie with his followers. They have money to send him 25 bucks because they believe in him, but they don't have $83 million to put up for him. And the Republican PACs that are behind him, they're not going to put it. So he's got to dig into his pocket. I don't think it's very unlikely he'll dig into his pocket for $83 million. He could come up with the bond. The bond is over 10%. So he'd have to pay $9 million to get the bond. And then if he loses, he's going to have to pay the 83 on top of the bond. And, and again, or does that bond get a bank does that, does or he can get a bond bank money go to E. Jean Carroll, yes or no? No, I don't think any money actually goes to E. Jean Carroll right now. Uh, so it's, it's security you, to make sure. It's security to make when sure. When you say she'll get the money someday, but not today, uh, she's eighty. I mean, I'm not suggesting that she 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 doesn't have a you know continued great long life ahead of her. I'm really not. I mean, I think you can live you know whatever. But uh, I am suggesting that you know she'd like to use that money sooner rather than later. Uh, what what reasonable timeline might there be? I mean, is there uh, are we talking about a year, two years? I mean, might he be able to drag it out that long before she gets any of these funds? Well, that's a great question. And to finish with Trump, Trump's third option would be to finance so, the 83 million, get some bank. But you ask yourself, what bank would lend him some money with the legal jeopardy? Let's not forget this was one of his lesser problems. It looks like he's got the two criminal indictments federally. He's got the two indictments stateside. He's got other civil cases. He's got that judge in the New York fraud case where the attorney general in New York, this is not the one in Georgia who has problems. This is James in New York who has no problems. Her office has no problems. And the only issue is how many hundreds of millions of dollars Trump is going to be awarded. So he may be a guy who's about to get $370 million awarded against him and his organization, um, $200 million. If you're a bank, you really do. Even if you're Deutsche Bank, you're one of his angels from, from before who think he's going to be president again. That's real money. That's real money that, for a bank to put out. And you got to look at his balance sheet, you know, not, not, not the nonsense with the three times the real size of the apartment thing. I mean, the scrutiny of the balance sheet now is going to be absolutely intense. So, but I think that's probably the most likely thing that he'll get some bank to put that up or he'll put up the 10 million. Now, turning to E. Jean Carroll, she has the same option. I mean, if you were a bank, 
and she's got these two awards, one for 83 million and one for five million. Wouldn't you lend her some money? I so see. I see. I see. I so think she she'll have borrow loads, against the judgment. Okay. She'll have loads and loads of people who want to, you know, it's like these people with the PI cases. They'll buy your PI case, but for peanuts of what it's worth, but you need the money so bad, right? Sure. You need to stay afloat while the insurance company jerks you around. Okay. Right. Um, but so she'll have to pay, but you know, if it's $88 million and they charge you these usurious rates, you know, E. Jean Carroll, take some, live a little, enjoy life, right? <laughs> yeah. And there'll be lots of people uh, willing to lend her money, uh, especially against the fact that, I mean, you say, what are the chances, Mark? Maybe the chances are 80% of her recovering, 80% chance that she's going to get, you know, it's a lot better than betting on a lot of stocks, right? It's a lot better than betting on petty stocks and even some other, you know, more established stocks. It's a pretty good bet. So she'll get some money. Remember, there's also the angels sitting out there with a the $10 million. Um, and uh, the, people settle. As I said, I think Trump is going to get the nomination and lose. I think that after January 2025, he's going to be a man with a huge desire to settle, including he'll want to settle this case. You know, what's this case worth in settlement value? If you say it's really 80%, it's 80% of 88 million to settle the two cases. Uh, if you think it's 50-50, wow. it's 40 million to settle the two cases. But Trump will pay serious, serious money in this case, probably after January 2025, to settle it, which is which is what happens with these things. If there's never any settlement and he fights it all the way, he'll argue that Judge Kaplan made errors in the first trial. If he wins the first trial, new trial there, he's going to effectively um, get a, a, well, he might not get a new trial on damages, but I, I just think it would be very fraught for the E. Jean Carroll side in the second damages trial if they were to lose the first trial and have to start all over again with the first trial. It's not like they're going to just throw it out and say, oh, well, you know, this is what Trump's view of reality is. And I think what a lot of his base is that, you know, some court's going to come along and say, you were the victim, Trump. No court's going to come along on appeal and say you were the victim. They're going to say Judge Kaplan made an error here. Uh, there was something wrong there. And so you get a new trial. Wow. Wow. It's fascinating. I mean, it, it, it uh, is worth the reminder, which you've just given us, that Trump's legal exposure is immense. It's actually a multiple of what this E. Jean Carroll judgment is in New York. Uh, and as you say, that that has come and gone, that that ship. So now it's just a question of how much, and the how much is likely, likely to be hundreds of millions of dollars. The, the reality is like to follow up on what he may have to do. I mean, he may have to borrow against some of these properties that he has, and I don't know to what extent he's able to do that. Uh, well, well, let me mention one last thing too. I can't believe that Haley can't make a political issue of this because Trump has exercised such poor judgment. It just seems to me that she's got the argument. Maybe you like Trump. Maybe you like what he did when he had his first term, but he's not the guy he used to be. Look at all the errors he used to look at all the errors he's making now. He used to be this Teflon Don. Remember that? He used to be this guy who the Supreme Court took two years to rule on his tax returns. You know, he never seemed to get pushed around by the courts. Yes, the Democrats were all trying to get him with all these witch hunts and everything else, but they never got close. Now, look at this. He's got a $5 million uh, verdict against him. Um, he didn't have the right lawyers. Why doesn't he hire the right lawyers? You want him to have the right cabinet, the right attorney general for the United States, do something about the border. He can't even manage his own legal affairs. Here's $83 million in this. He's lost it, okay? Trump has lost it. He's not the old Trump. I can't believe Haley can't make that argument. Yeah, no, it's, and, and that's the way it gets out of the public discourse if she makes it. That's a really good point. Uh, hey, David, thank you for, you know, responding to our urgent call here. And I look forward to speaking to you on Thursday. Really do appreciate it. Great to be with you on a really a breathtaking. I mean, when people saw $83 million, they, uh, uh, I know a lot of people who were really gleeful because they thought that Trump had always gotten away with all of his maneuvers, that somehow, no matter what he did, he always got away with it in the courts. And when they saw $83 million, at least as matters stand now, he sure didn't get away with what he did with E. Jean Carroll. And when he commented on it, he didn't defame her again. So and this is, yeah, he, as, as you say, I mean, that was, uh, he understands he can't crowd the plate anymore. And, you know, that was a jury. That wasn't one crazy judge who's, you know, got up. That was a jury uh, that awarded Unanimous, that. unanimous with nine, five men. This wasn't, you know, uh, nine, you know, crazed feminists who uh, railroaded him in New York City. Five men, four women, all unanimous. Wow. Good stuff. Thanks, David.
Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.